Hey everyone, welcome back to Great Northwest Weaponry. This is Thomas, and today we are taking a look at the Steyr Monlicker Model 1895, or also known as the 189530 uh, carbine. This is an awesome, uh, awesome piece. I've wanted one of these for quite a while. This is actually my first straight pole bolt action. And uh, really, it, I think it is the first straight pole bolt action is uh, the old Monlickers. And uh, this is based on the uh, the Model 1890 Cavalry Carbine originally. This one is, like I said, the, the 9530. That is a collector's term. That was not a term used in the day when these were actually made. But this gun would have been produced originally in uh, any time from 1895 until the fall of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Receivers for these, in Austria at least, were not produced after the fall of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. The Czechs did make these later into the, I think into the early 20s. I don't, I don't know off the top of my head exactly when they stopped. But long story short, Steyr, uh, the Budapest factory, made these up until 1918 when the Austro-Hungarian Empire capitulated. Originally, it would have been a 50 and a half inch long gun. And then in the 30s, they were cut down and a couple of modifications were made. The original chambering for this gun was 8x50 Monlicker and it was changed to 8x56. And I specify Monlicker, not Manlicker. Monlicker is how you're supposed to say it. Everybody calls them Manlickers, which just kind of sounds a little strange to me. Don't know why. <laughs> But uh, they were designed by Ferdinand Monlicker, again, to uh, replace the, uh, the, I think it's called the 8890, and it's based on the 90 Cavalry Carbine. But it's an awesome piece. I'm really happy I found it. There's another piece I picked up from my friends at the Warfront. And uh, you notice this, this bolt, well, if I turn the safety off, it's quick if you work it. You have to really intend on what you're doing because it is fairly stiff and that we'll, we'll go into markings a bit when we get this thing on the table but uh there's some interesting things about the bolt on these they were all hand fitted and originally were not serial numbered serial numbers were added later but like i say we'll get into that more when we go to the table but this one uh this one was modified in uh, bulgaria and it appears that it went to germany after that of which is not uncommon most of these guns wound up in the hands of nazi germany uh, in the lead up to World War II and during World War II uh, coming from, in the case of this one, Bulgaria, but then also Austria and Hungary and even uh, the, the old Czech ones. Uh, these guns were uh, come in three different uh, stock variations. It's just three different kinds of wood. So originally they were made of walnut. That was the standard of the Austro-Hungarian Empire was walnut stocks. But by mid World War I, they started running out and had to switch to Elm. This one appears to be Elm. And uh, then they also had, uh, oh, what's it called, Beach. And Beach is really easy to identify as it's a bright yellow. But yeah, this one, uh, to the best of my knowledge, is 1916 production. And again, we'll look at that a little closer here in a moment. But that would line up with the Elm stock. But there's also a weird contradiction there, which, again, we'll, we'll get to. For that matter, let's just go ahead and go to the table and take a look at some of these things I've been talking about. So, we've already briefly touched on a lot of the markings. Um, I mentioned that this is dated 1916. You can kind of see under that S, the end of the 16, the full date would be printed on here. And that is one thing with the dates. They're not entirely reliable because the date stamped on, on the barrel on these guns was actually the service date, the date that it was put into service, not necessarily the date of manufacture. With this one being 1916, again, to the best of what I can tell, it's probably accurate that that is when it was manufactured as well, considering during World War I, these pretty much went into service right off the line. Now, the reason I mentioned earlier, though, that, uh, that you might not be able to tell for sure based on the stock on this one, the stock is match numbered to bolt, receiver, barrel, everything on the right side, but the original stamp would have been on the left, and it looks like it's been scratched out, kind of, but original stamps were on the left side of the stock, and when they reworked the guns in the 30s, they restamped it. And speaking of stamps that came about probably in the 30s, if you look right at the tip of my thumb, you can probably barely see it, but there is a Nazi eagle and Waffen up there. That is something that is not common and is very cool, but 
that is highly likely that that stamp is fake. Though most of these guns did wind up in the hands of the Germans, they almost never stamped them because they didn't manufacture any of the parts for them. They didn't do any of the modifications. They just put them straight into reserves for the Volkssturm and for police. And as such, it's not unlikely that this gun maybe saw use by the Volkssturm during the storming of Berlin or something, but it's very unlikely that that stamp is real. I would like to think that it is, but I'm not getting my hopes up. Luckily, I didn't pay a premium for that stamp being there. Now, I'd mentioned the S being stamped over top of the date here. The reason for that, uh, well, the, not really the reason, but what that means, this S, this variation of S, means that this was reworked in Bulgaria. There are two different uh, styles of S that you'll see on the 90, uh, the 9530s in particular. There's an S with no tails on the ends and an S with tails on the ends. No tails on the ends of the S means that it was reworked by Steyr. If the S has tails on the end, then it was reworked in Bulgaria. And if it's an H rather than an S, then it was reworked in Hungary at the Budapest factory. Your safety is back here. Safety only works if the bolt is not been cocked back. So observe bolt is now back and that notch right there is what the safety fits into it's kind of stiff but it is workable extraction of the bolt pull the bolt back and then you push forward on the trigger and then pull now more often than not this will rotate and slide back in i don't know why it didn't that time i guess i got lucky but we're gonna make it do it anyway if we can here kind of stiff <laughs> yeah it's it's just not wanting to so we'll uh maybe see if we can get it to do so again yep it's just sticking that actually is ideal for uh for getting the bolt back into the gun normally you'd have to force rotate the end of the bolt back into place because it snaps into the out of sync position as soon as you extract it from the gun. More often than not, could be just because it's hot for me firing it that's not doing that. I don't know. I haven't really had that happen yet, but like I say, it makes it a little more convenient for the reinstallation of the bolt. Now, one thing with this gun that I'm not a fan of, after the, when they were modified, they put the sling there for some reason, right where your fingers land. You don't really notice it when you're shooting it, but it is there and it is annoying. Now let's take a look at these end blocks. This is an end block fed rifle. And loading these end blocks is kind of interesting. It took me a minute to figure it out, but it's not that bad. You see how the top is wider here? You go straight in at the top and just slide the bullets down. There are five round clips, internal magazine on the gun and the magazine just falls out or the clip just falls out the bottom when you're done shooting. And uh, yeah, it's very cool, very cool piece. I'm very happy with it. Let's go ahead and shoot it some more. Man liquor, our prices have never been lower. I apologize, I had to channel my inner Dwight Schrute. Back to our regularly scheduled programming. Again, I apologize, I just had to. <laughs> I'm having a lot of fun with this thing. Uh, you notice the bolt works really quick. If you, you kind of have to manhandle it. You don't mess around and just, just like, mm, if you just kind of try to pull, it doesn't really, you have to mean it. But if you mean it, it goes quick. Uh, so quick, in fact, during World War I, the Austro-Hungarian soldiers referred to this as the Ruksuk, or fast as a flash rifle. Uh, and even the Italians who got their hands on a lot of these wrote a song about it. Uh, they, they had their own nickname for it, Tapum, and the song is called Tapum, also written during World War I. And uh, that is one thing we haven't touched on as much. At the end of World War I, th these were actually supposed to be phased out. The original long rifles were supposed to be phased out in 1914, but as most of us are aware, 1914 is when the Ar Archduke of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, Franz Ferdinand, was assassinated, so the war kicked off. So these stayed in service. They were working on something with a smaller, faster moving cartridge rather than the 
absolute bear that is 8x50 or the later 8x56. Uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty mean <laughs> in every way. By the end of the war, these went two places primarily. Uh, some stayed in uh, the former Austro-Hungarian Empire. Most of them went to Bulgaria, of which this one, as we've covered already, is one of those. And uh, several were sent to Italy as well as reparations because the Austro-Hungarian Empire did a lot of damage to Italy. And thus, when they lost, inevitably, they wound up paying most of their reparations directly to Italy. And a lot of it came in the form of guns, some of it in the form of these. Those were turned into other things, of which if we ever get our hands on an Italian modified one, we'll take a look at it. But that is not the 9530 as you see here today. The ones that went to Bulgaria or stayed in the former Austro-Hungarian Empire, most of them turned, were turned into 9530s. And uh, yeah, it's, I'd already mentioned the bolt and how it's, uh, the, the serial number on the bolt is unreliable because that serial number was added after World War One. It was during the 1930s modifications, a serial number was added to the bolt because stupidly, um, in my opinion, these bolts, they're hand fitted and they didn't serial number them. So if you extracted the bolt to clean and then someone else next to you extracted his bolt to clean and you grabbed each other's bolts on accident, one of them might not fit at all. And that leads to some uh, rather unfair criticisms about these having a almost unworkable bolt. That's usually because it doesn't have its original bolt in it. This one's not terrible, but you do have to, like I said, you, you can't just kind of pull on it. You've got to mean it. And I almost hit myself in the face there. That would have been an unfortunate metal butt plate. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a fascinating piece. It's a piece that I've wanted for a while. Most straight poles that you see are based on the Steyr M95, uh, particularly I know for certain the, uh, the Ross Model 1905, which is kind of considered a failed experiment in the straight pole, but it is based on the Steyr M95. I believe the Swiss K11s are as well, though those weren't a failure like the Ross 1905. But yeah, they're awesome guns, a lot of history behind them, a lot to talk about. We will be bringing this gun out again for, uh, I've, I've got a few ideas of some pretty cool videos I think you guys like involving this gun. So stick around and, uh, and you'll get to find out on some of that. Meanwhile, I hope you enjoyed this video. This has been Thomas with Great Northwest Weaponry, and I'll see you next time.